Thank you all. Please be seated and good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Mr. Ch good morning, Joe. How are you? All right. Mr. Chandler, are you ready to go? Let's go. Okay. Okay. Thank you. to the defendant's motion for a new trial. We submitted it electronically to your office and to Mr. Chandler's office, but the original uh, has now been clocked in in Clarendon County and brought to me to be joined with the original file. And I wanted you to have a certified copy as well as Mr. Chandler. All right, thank you, Mr. Finney, and I do have a copy of it. I did receive it. And there's no objection. Is that correct, Mr. Chandler? Yes. Very good. Photograph. Thank you. No objection. no objection. Okay. We also, Your Honor, would intend to move into evidence the map, States Exhibit Number Two, which is what we call the small map uh, that was used yesterday to identify the Green Hill Church. Uh, the larger map, which is States Exhibit Number One, we would like to give back to the owner who's going to testify shortly this this morning and uh can you take it to a print shop and get a print done we can do that all right and it's already been marked so we'll mark it with the sticker on and give the original back to the owner thank you yes thank sir you. we can switch it out as long as it's an exact copy thank you thank you They are entered in evidence, yes, ma'am. And Joe, have you figured out how you're numbering these? Okay. We would ask that this witness be allowed to testify from here so that it will broadcast throughout. She can't testify from over there with the PowerPoint and it broadcasts otherwise. Okay, it's my, it's my understanding that the PowerPoint she intends on using doesn't have any pictures or diagrams that she necessarily needs to point to. Is there any reason why those, that PowerPoint can't be put out, obviously, on the screens? But it would seem to me that she would have a problem testifying from the witness stand. She can have a copy of it herself in front of her, and there should be a screen that there is on the witness stand, so that shouldn't be a problem. She shouldn't need to stand there. So you don't want this put out on the screen? She I said it was it fine. She could put it on the screen. I have no problem with that. That just requires someone to be able to use it as a PowerPoint through their computer. You may want to talk to your, <laughs> you may want to talk to your IT people, but they can go through it as a PowerPoint. It doesn't need to be placed on the Elmo. I think she's going to need to get a computer to the witness chair. And she, is she able to do that? Because we were, we were struggling Burgess, with that come from help him. We were struggling with that from 9 to 10, that they said that couldn't happen. But if, it, if this can, we can do it per perfectly. There shouldn't be any reason why it can't from a computer go to a on PowerPoint. Right, screen. somebody would just have to physically go to the next exactly. one from there, and then she can testify from the stand. 
which I hope they know how to do. <laughs> Will it go on the screen? It will go on the screen. If you see the screen up there. Stand here and click the sides. I'm pulling the PowerPoint, Your Honor. I want to get this testimony. I, I don't know how it, you know, how it works with her testimony. Mr. Chandler, you're making it more difficult than it really is. Mr. Burgess, I assure okay. you, can come up and just That's forward fine. each screen. That's fine. Thank it's you. one of the nice things we have with technology. The problem is, is sometimes we don't know how to use it. But uh, I will say that this new courthouse is absolutely gorgeous. I haven't been in Sumter. Uh, since I first came on the bench eight years ago, and uh, this new courthouse really is wonderful and certainly state-of-the-art. Um, they just need to educate our lawyers on how to use it. So, <laughs> And I will say sometimes our younger people uh, have the benefit of having grown up with all this technology that maybe some of us haven't. So um, I am confident that Mr. Burgess can take care of this and help us along. And I'm also uh, certain that this doctor can also tell you when to forward the screen in her testimony. Okay? We went to make copies, we went to make copies it's for you, Judge, and the copy machine broke. They're going to have to go take it and go somewhere else. Please stand. Please stand. Please stand. Amanda Salas, MD, S-A-L-A-S. You solemnly swear a firm testimony of yes. this court be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so if you have. I so affirm. Thank you. Absolutely. May we move on and qualify her while we're waiting for that? Yes. Just state your name and spell your last for the record. Dr. Amanda Salas, A-M-A-N-D-A, -A -A, last name Salas, S-A-L-A-S. Dr. Salas, good morning. Good morning. Dr. Salas, um, you were contacted by my firm as um, and asked to uh, testify here today in the Stenny case. Before we begin, I would like for you to give us your educational background and qualifications to determine if the court will allow you to, to testify in this area. I'm a medical doctor. I attended school at USC in Columbia, South Carolina. I graduated in 2003. I went on to complete a psychiatry residency which I entered at the Medical College of Georgia in 2003. I moved on into a child and adolescent psychiatry fellowship program in 2006, which was completed in 2008. I worked for one year, and then I went back into fellowship training from 2009 until 2010 at the University of South Carolina in Columbia, and I completed a fellowship in forensic psychiatry. In all those years, I have become board certified as a general adult psychiatrist, a child and adolescent psychiatrist, and a forensic psychiatrist. Have you testified in general sessions court and been qualified as a witness in doing so? Yes, I have. Approximately how many times? In general sessions court, I've provided testimony, I would estimate maybe around 15 times. And uh, in other courts in this state, um, how many times have you been qualified to testify as an expert? I've been te qualified to testify as an expert in probate court. I lost track of it. I would estimate somewhere between 100 and 200 times. Um, in the nature of your testimony, has it been um, the general sessions uh, type of testimony? Has that been for the state, most of it? I have provided testimony when I worked with the Department of Mental Health while I was in my fellowship training. Um, I've also provided testimony where I've been retained by the defense. Oh, what has the area of your testimony been in? I've provided expert testimony pertaining to competency to stand trial issues, competency to be executed issues, as well as testimony related to the reliability of confessions or statements given in the context of sexual abuse cases. We would offer her as an expert. All right. Mr. Finney? May it please the court, may I examine? Yes, sir. Dr. Salas, good morning. Good morning. As part of your training, Dr. Salas, uh, did you take special courses in child psychology and the workings of the child's mind? The setup of doing child psychiatry, which is what I am um, board certified in, it's not only related to taking classes and doing um, studies that are part of your course instruction, but we also had direct clinical experience that was the bulk of where our training lied 
in terms of taking book knowledge and how it applies to the clinical scenarios. And were you working with children, live children, at this time with the clinical studies? With clinical studies, yes. The children that we treated were alive, yes. And were, were these children from various backgrounds? Some were charged with crime, some were uh, victims of crime, some different backgrounds? Which training are you referring to? Uh, any, All of any training that yes. you may have had? Yes. Okay. Uh, in, in the example you talked about a minute ago, uh, I believe you said that as part of your training and studies, you've testified and analyzed children's statements. Yes, sir. That's correct. Have you ever analyzed, have you ever testified in a case where you didn't have the child that was the subject of the examination available to talk to? Yes, I have. Oftentimes, um, when you are retained for the defense and the defense is representing the accused, you do not have access to the victim who would not be able to participate in an interview with me. And your qualifications to testify and offer expert testimony for the defense would be uh, for a defendant who you have spoken with as opposed to the child who might have been the victim that you didn't sp speak to? Oftentimes the review of the, the statements that are given does not require an interview of the accused, and so that doesn't come into play. Right. Uh, have you ever testified in a case like this where you are testifying on behalf of the defense in support of George Stenney, and you didn't have an opportunity to speak to George Stenney or read a statement that George Stenney wrote? I would like to clarify that I'm not testifying on behalf of George Stenney. I'm testifying to the material that I have reviewed. I have been retained by the defense. This is the first time that I've had a cold case where I don't have access to people who are still alive, but it is not the first time where I've had to rely on information that pertains to a statement that was given without the ability to interview the person who gave the statement. All right, thank you. May I have one moment? No. Uh, thank the court for the allowing the time. We uh, do not object to this witness testifying as an expert. Okay, thank you. My presumption continues, Your Honor, we're now trying to go elsewhere and get the copies of the PowerPoint. How do we know? I think we're fine. What's on the screen currently is the documents that Dr. Salas reviewed um, in an effort to reach her conclusion. So I don't think there's a problem with the first one. So let's go Thank ahead and so go much. forward and ask her. Dr. Salas, uh, before um, uh, being retained by our firm discussing this case, did you have experience with uh, the George Stenney case? I did, yes, sir. Would you tell us what that is? When I was in my residency program fellowship for forensic psychiatry, part of the training requirements are that you complete a grand rounds presentation on an area of study that you have conducted. And the area of study that I conducted pertained to the changing legal standards of the protections that were offered to children over the last century. And specifically, I had studied um, the George Stinney case and compared it to Robert Conyers, who was also from Clarendon County and the differences in the protections that the legal field may have had to offer at one point in time compared to another point in time. At the time, in 2010, when I made this presentation, one of the topics of discussion was the move to have adolescents who have committed a um, capital crime where they could not get a sentence of death and life without um, parole was the, the legal standard that evolved at that time. So you have a familiarity with the facts and circumstances surrounding this case? Yes. Okay. We're talking now about your uh, professional um, investigation of this case. Would you advise the court uh, what you have done in order to further your knowledge of this case in order to render, render an opinion as to the reliability of a confession allegedly made by George Stinney, Jr.? The sources of information that I have relied on are the um, lists that appear on the screen before you, so I will go through it. Um, it actually is way more extensive than the sources of information that I had when I did my presentation. Um, 
and I find that these are more direct sources of information. But I did conduct a review of the records that were made available to me to include the affidavits and the statements as listed for Wilford Johnny Hunter, Amy Ruffner, Catherine Robinson, Bishop Charles Stenney, Reverend Francis Batson. I also reviewed the medical report that was signed by Dr. A.C. Bazard and the letter that Dr. That, excuse me, that Governor Johnston had responded to Mr. Ford and the comments that Mr. Ford sent in response to Governor Johnston's letter. I also had ability to review the notes that were handwritten by the Detective Newman, the notes that were handwritten by the prosecutor, Mr. McLeod. I had opportunity to see the visual pictures of George Stinney and review a picture of Betty June Benneker with her bicycle. I also had opportunity to review the legal motions that had the stipulation of facts included in them. I had opportunity to provide um, and conduct interviews with Johnny Hunter, who was made available to me via telephone interview, as well as an interview of um, Amy Ruffner and Catherine Robinson, sisters of George Stinney. Thank you. Um, based upon those interviews and the review of the documents that uh, you have outlined here, do you feel that you can form an opinion as to the reliability of the confession in this case? My opinion is based on um, my cognitive beliefs. It's not an opinion based on a feeling, but after going through the methodology that would be standard in the field for conducting an assessment of reliability, I do have an opinion um, that is a professional p opinion related to the reliability of this case. Why would an otherwise innocent person, in your professional opinion, your research background and training, um, admit to something that they didn't do? It's very common that people will give statements for a variety of reasons and confess and give an I did it and here are the narratives as pertaining to that and yet they are not the person who perpetrated the event related to the statement that they have given. There are a lot of psychological factors that may come into play. Those have been documented in the records um, and in the literature since as the 1860s was as far back as I could find a reference for that psychological factors did come into play and should be evaluated when someone does an assessment of the reliability or the validity of a statement that has been given. I can't say what motivates one person over another with 100% accuracy, but certainly what we do is look at the psychological factors, which is where my limit of expertise lies in giving an opinion as to whether something is more or less likely to result in a false confession. And in this case, what would those factors be? If you would advance to slide number six, please. <coughs> the one that, um, yep. slide number five, I'm sorry. The one that is titled, How Reliable is the Confession? And may I get a cup of water, please? Yes. Thank you. I believe you had asked me about how do I conduct the methodology for evaluating the reliability of a confession or the reliability of a statement, is that correct? Okay. Um, on the screen you can see four components that one would look towards in looking at how reliable is a confession. The first two um, are usually more objective in being able to have something that's defined in black and white which is, does the confession fit the evidence that is available? Um, does the confession have internal consistency? The psychological factors that are very prominent come into these last two, which is, what was the characterization of the interrogator suspect interaction? And what is the psychological makeup of the confessor? Why would someone then um, if, would you go through each of those areas and, and discuss how they relate in your mind to this case? Absolutely. Advance to slide next, please. The breakdown of the four questions 
is as follows. Um, first, we're looking at whether or not the confession fits the evidence that is available. When I went through the materials that I had available to review, which I must say is limited um, in terms of not having the same volume and um, breadth of material that perhaps might be available with um, a case that is currently available and not a cold case. What I reviewed indicated that there was a size and power mismatch between the accused and the victims. Um, even if you don't account for the physical size, you have one person against two people, and that's a mismatch in terms of how do you account for one being able to overcome two. Um, I had to acknowledge that that was a factor that came into my mind when I reviewed the documentation of facts. Um, I also had the ability to, as I said, conduct interviews and I found that both Amy and Catherine, George's sisters, serve as alibis for where he would have been in the time that this was alleged to have happened. Um, I understand that there's a broad time frame, but Amy was able to indicate and state exactly what was going on when she and George walked the cow Lizzie, when they returned to the home, and Catherine was able to verify that they were all in the home and in proximity with um, what their normal daily activities were after school while um, for the remainder of the afternoon. Did you interview them separately? I did interview them separately. When I conducted the interviews, it was limited to me and the person who I was interviewing, and nobody else was available in the room. Continue, um, please. Additional evidence that I found in the record was that there were several descriptions of what the alleged weapon was. I'm still not exactly clear what the weapon is, um, but it has been described as a variety of being a spike or an iron instrument of some sort and there was a misfit um, or a disconnect between the description that we had in the record and what evolved or came forth in the medical examiner's report um, and so that was part of the consideration as well. The other things that I made note of was the lack of material that was available and um, there was no additional physical evidence that I obtained in the interviews of the sisters specifically in which George, upon return from having walked Lizzie that afternoon, he did not have markings that were alarming to them. They did not see his appearance as any different than what he would have looked like other than any other day of the week when he would take Lizzie out to graze. Um, he didn't have any physical symptoms of having been involved in a conflict or anything. Um, the other thing that I made note of is the fact that the identification of the murder weapon is something that is, is fluid, it's shifting, it's changing. I don't know what the murder weapon is. I don't know where the murder weapon is. It's not been documented as having been identified and agreed upon with consistency. That is something that in the available records specifically from the Detective Newman's notes, from the solicitor, um, I believe his name was Mr. McLeod, his notes, and another, perhaps the indictment, described it in different context. Um, well, specifically, the, um, can you address an initially from the investigator's notes what it was described as versus what was in the trial record? Let me reference. I'm trying to read this handwriting um, from New Mr. Newman's notes. A piece of iron about 15 inches long. And in the solicitor's record? I have spike written down twice. And you indicated you reviewed Dr. Bazard's medical Yes, but if I could, I would also like to note that it's in the record that 
Detective Newman does not reference a spike in his notes, and the solicitor, uh, Mr. McLeod, does not reference a piece of iron about 15 inches long. Continue then on your outlook, um, your opinion on the lack of reliability from the um, scientific background that you've studied. In addition to looking for witnesses that could serve as alibis and finding that information, which just kind of came to me. If we could go back, I was sorry. Thank you. I did not find any statements from other witnesses who could identify and say, I saw George Stinney in proximity with these girls outside of the statement that Amy had made, that they had this interaction. So there's not another party that has come forth that has said, I saw him with the two victims in this context. So the context that puts George Stinney in proximity to the two victims is information that Amy is able to verify at this point in time. And there is a lack of witnesses that um, have put him in proximity with them. In regards to the medical record from Dr. Bazard, the letter from Governor Johnston indicates that he had a personal conversation with Detective Newman and that Detective Newman had identified the motivation as a sexually motivated crime. However, when you review the records from Dr. Bazard as well as um, for, for both of what would constitute the autopsy reports, there was not a documented medical history that suggested that this was something that had a penetrating sex motivation and that the hymens were still intact. There was some bruising that was noted on Betty June Benneker's genitalia, um, but there was an alternate explanation that was very reasonable and likely to explain that, which is her um, riding the bicycle. So the other thing I look towards, because sometimes you won't find a um, physical exam finding when you have a sexual abuse crime. I had to put into context, context more information and go f see if I could find out what George Stinney's interest may have been to identify him at a stage of sexual development and interest. In the interviews that I conducted with his sisters, um, are that he actually had no expressed interest in following a female population. He didn't have interest in terms of um, going and looking for girlfriends or even expressing an interest in the opposite sex. In fact, the interests that he had were probably, one would describe them as less mature than that of which would be expected of a 14-year-old who you would expect to have raging testosterone through their body. His were more into um, playing marbles, reading books, um, making whistles. He enjoyed art, and those were the things that he enjoyed. He would draw planes that would fly overhead, which was not congruent with what one would expect to find in somebody who has a vested sexualized interest in the opposite gender um, to be sexually motivated. So tell me then what your um, findings were and your basis professionally um, for determining how someone uh, of his age would give a confession to something that he didn't do. Um, so you want me to move from this to how would George give a confession for something that he wouldn't do? If Unless you're not through with what you're... I'm not through. Okay. <laughs> then, then roll on I apologize. <laughs> Hence the slides, because as you can tell, this is rather detailed and lengthy. Um, after you move past trying to resolve the question of does the confession fit the evidence that is made available, if we can advance to the next slide, what we're looking for is whether or not the confession is internally consistent. Internal consistency refers to whether or not um, a person is giving the same statement over and over again. So if I have ridden my bicycle down to the store to buy milk and eggs for my mother, and that's what I tell you, and I told you I rode my pink bike with a, a bell on it, 
Um, and then the next day, I come and I say, well, I took my sister's bike. I went to a different store for a different purpose. The story, even though it originates from me, is not the same. And thus, it is not internally consistent because the facts that I have provided are very different. And so that's what I'm referring to when I look for internal consistency. One of the concerns that I have is that the murder weapon, as described by Detective Newman's notes and Solicitor McLeod, and the indictment is fluid over time, and um, I'm not even certain exactly how it would have been described in the interrogation of period of giving and eliciting the confession because that unfortunately is not transcribed or recorded in any way for me to be able to review. But what I do see is that it has shifted in the reports that surround the confession. I would have expected that at the time Detective Newman had made his notes, I understand that he was there at the scene where the bodies were found, maybe there would be a discrepancy at that time, but from the time he got a confession and a report as to where he could go find a weapon, I would expect consistency from that point forward in the description. So once you had the weapon, that would be over? Once you had the weapon or you had a description and a confession that you found to be reliable, you would expect it to be described reliably over the course of time. So when I look to the issue of internal consistency, these descriptions are concerning and quite frankly alarming. Um, the other thing you look towards in confessions is when they confess in a custodial setting, do they maintain the same statements outside of that custodial confession? Through the interviews I conducted, um, specifically with, we can advance to the next slide, specifically with Johnny Hunter, who was 17 years old and the cellmate of George Stinney when George was detained in the Sumter jail, um, Johnny described to me that George consistently interrupted him and asked questions pertaining to, I want to reference my notes so I don't change what he told me. Johnny described that when they would be doing whatever, whether it was looking at comic books or eating candy or just sitting, Sometimes they would be laughing. Outside of that context, George would just shift in his demeanor, change his expression. He would say, Johnny, why would they want to electrocute me on something I didn't do? And this was a thought that George had constantly on his mind. And Johnny acknowledged that he had no explanation for it. And it would just be a moment where they would sit and pause because George was very much aware of the gravity of the situation. I specifically asked Johnny whether or not he believed George to understand the meaning of execution because I felt that um, in analyzing the word electrocution, it was important to know that the words that George was were using were things that he truly had an understanding of. And I wouldn't have expected him to have known that word outside the context of the circumstances in which he was in. And Johnny made it very clear that George was certainly aware that execution meant the death that was given to him for the conviction of the charge that was brought against him and that he knew it was going to, he was going to die via electrocution or at least through execution and um, that this was so distressing for George that even in the context of having a moment where they were having a positive interaction George would shift in his affect and change um, his thoughts. The other place where I found that George um, had denied having anything to do with this was a statement in the interview with Amy in which she acknowledged the family having received information, a written letter from George that no longer exists, and he denied it there as well. Can we move past that? And and Solicitor stood up, obviously, that is 
that, that is what we talked about uh, okay. outside of this okay. record. Right. And again, she didn't testify to that yesterday, so. We're, we're going to, with your permission, could we move past that? Judge? Absolutely. Thank you. All right. I apologize. My computer is in, I don't know what it's doing, but it's coming back where it needs to be. So that resolves the information I have in terms of looking for internal consistency. And this brings us to the third question, which is what is the characterization of the interrogator suspect interaction, which really means what are the psychological factors and how do they apply in the context of how an interrogation is conducted. We look to two issues pertaining to suggestibility and compliance, and that's what the two arrows represent. Um, to the left on a low scale, to the right on a high scale. And this is perceived as a continuum. This is not black and white, which is probably most of y'all in this court are familiar with. We live in a gray world when we practice mental health and psychiatry, and so we speak in terms of continuums. Perhaps that makes our practice of medicine a little bit more difficult, but this is going to be discussed in terms of a continuum from low to high. And the factors that we're going to look at are suggestibility and compliance. When you move up into the high areas of high suggestibility and high compliance as seen on the next slide, this is where you have an increased likelihood of dealing with a false confession. So if you have low suggestibility or low compliance, then you are dealing with something that's more likely to be reliable. So looking at suggestibility, next slide. About age alone, 14 years of age, outside um, having an adult available to him in the context of how an interview would have been conducted or an interrogation would have been conducted. By age alone, you would, you would note that George would be more suggestible, especially when you pair that with um, adult males that are two to one present in the context of the interrogation. And so just accepting the fact that our brains are not developed at 14, which is supported by the literature because myelination is continuing until you're in your mid-20s, that is going to influence him to become more suggestible than if you had somebody who was being in the same situation and by age alone being the only difference they were an adult. So he would be more suggestible than to giving a statement yes. that might not be true. Yes. Continue, please. I gathered some information pertaining to the cultural perspectives that George may have have influenced him. We all grow up in families that have their own unique cultures and values, and I needed to understand exactly what those cultures and values would have been. And from the information of um, the affidavits that were provided in the interviews with his sisters, what I learned is that there was certainly a family culture that black people were separate from white people. They did not commingle. They did not interact together and that um, there was a reservation that came over them as individuals when they did find an opportunity to be in the presence of a white person. There was a level of respect that they automatically would give, whether that would be to not speak or to speak and maintain their distance. Um, so in identifying that as the family's culture, I had to figure out, does this apply to George? And the information from Johnny strongly supports that it did apply to George. And what he described is he was present, Johnny was present when George came into the detention center. And he described him coming in with white uniformed officers um, and being, appeared to be very frightened. Frightened is Johnny's word, that is not my word. He also said that when the white men left, the officers had left the premise, that George's demeanor shifted and changed. Was this a segregated holding area? The jails were segregated. Johnny laughed at me when I asked whether or not there might have been any white people detained in the same detention center. So it was clearly segregated and to the point that 
he found it humorous that I wouldn't have inherently held that knowledge. Um, so in that one incident, perhaps one might question, is that enough information? What I found is that in the time that George was there, he had no other contact with white people because white people were not part of his daily um, environment. And the next time he had direct contact was when he was being picked up from the detention center and being taken to his execution in Columbia. Um, and Johnny said that he had his demeanor change drastically, not in the context of knowing that that might have been the day that he was going to Columbia for his execution, but in the moment when the white men came back into proximity. So when I take those factors into play, it appears to me that the family culture was certainly a cultural, personal um, identity that George had adopted. Dr. Salas, I'm going to interrupt you, but can you tell me when you did these interviews with uh, the sisters and Mr. Hunter? I interviewed Mr. Hunter on the telephone. Today is Wednesday, Tuesday on Monday afternoon of this week, and I interviewed Catherine yesterday afternoon from 2 to 3, and I interviewed Amy from approximately 3 until 3.45. So you never had an opportunity or didn't use the opportunity to interview these people when you were doing your dissertation? Um, did when not. your investigation of this. And the reason why I ask that is it would be helpful if someone had interviewed Johnny Green, the brother who was also taken by the police, and again, we don't know that, but presumably interrogated as well to understand what had occurred. That So you didn't have the opportunity or didn't take the opportunity when you did your dissertation to speak with these people. I didn't even know that Johnny was um, interviewed and detained with George at the time I did my dissertation. But what I did learn in the interview with the sisters is that as a result of the arrest and interrogation of Johnny, that his affect and behavior surrounding the interrogation changed him such that he was not even able to discuss it at all from that point forward with the family when they would try to make inquiry with him, which points to an acute stress that he carried with him for a remainder of his life. But I can't say specifically how that would have impacted Johnny because I do not have the luxury of being able to interview him. So when we combine age, cultural considerations that we can now apply to George, what we are left with is a power differential that is inherently present in a custodial interrogation setting. I am not here to say that just because somebody is interrogated in a custodial setting that it's a false confession. So please do not, <laughs> please do not think that that is my message. Um, but aside from those inherent factors, we have two more very significant factors that increase that gap and that power differential, being the cultural dynamics and the age. You're not suggesting uh, any criticism of the police behavior in uh, conducting these interviews, are you? I have no information about how the interviews were conducted to render any kind of opinion on that matter. All right. Well, please continue. That finishes suggestibility, so now we move on to compliance, and we're looking again at the element of compliance as it applies to the interaction when the interrogation was going on. When we look to the compliance, I'm looking at patterns of behavior. Um, Let me interrupt you just a second. Certainly. Could you tell us what compliance means as far as this individual or an individual who may be undergoing uh, interrogation? It, I can answer your question with a question, I believe. <laughs> compliance pertains to the question of how likely is this person going to cooperate with giving a statement that may be untrue because they are feeling pressure to produce that statement. So how compliant is an individual when they feel whether it is present or um, 
almost as if it's just an inherent feeling that the the person being interrogated feels if they take it on to feel as if there's an element of coercion or pressure put on them in order to comply with whatever the dynamics are going on. So we're looking to see how likely would one be to conform their behaviors to fit what the pressure source is putting onto them. So one could supply coercion without being, as we know, coercive, without being forceful, just by their presence, demeanor, race, position, et cetera. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's kind of like I can feel um, I can feel like someone has sexually violated me in some way if I walk down the street and someone whistles at me and I take that to mean one thing and that meaning has nothing to do with anything other than someone was whistling and it has nothing to do with me. It's the same concept that what I perceive will influence my thoughts and my behaviors even though the other person who's a party of that interaction has no intent of me perceiving it in that way. Okay. Can you continue, please, ma'am? Yes. Um, so what I learned about George is that outside of the interrogation, he was the person who was described by Johnny um, when in the jail. He complied with all the rules. He was not aggressive with other people. He was not confrontational with other people. He did not own or possess contraband. He had times where he had candy. He looked at comic books. However, he never approached violation of the rules. Specifically, I asked pertaining to he knew he was going to die. What did he have to lose in trying to escape? And Johnny said that wasn't his nature. He never contemplated that. He never put forth any behaviors that would suggest that that was something he was thinking about, that George was there interacting and behaving in a way that was cooperative and what would be expected of the rules that had been put on him. I also got a similar story um, and report from both sisters who acknowledged that their parents were strict and that um, behavior was not a problem in trying to get George to comply with rules that were put forth in the home environment. And as I already noted in terms of um, the previous slides, that Johnny's term was that George appeared, quote, frightened when he was in the presence of the uniformed white men. And your conclusion from that? That he found that there was a power differential and he was on the weaker end. Continue, please, ma'am. The brevity of the interview was, as I understand, approximately one hour in which this um, context was going on and the confession being made. I would love to have had a transcript of some sort, a document, a recording, um, somebody's notes to be able to review. But that one hour was significant enough that it impacted Johnny's life even though he was released and he was never brought forth on charges pertaining to the crime against these two girls. Um, it suggests to me that perhaps there was an element of coercion that was present even if it was owned only by um, George or by Johnny that would make it very likely for one of them to quote unquote cave in and to comply with what they perceived to be the desired behavior in the context of what was going on. So when this, uh, these interviews were taken, uh, if we assume that uh, one of the interviewing officers had been called to the scene of this murder, that he had been at the scene, that he had observed the bodies, that he had observed the injury to the bodies, the, at least superficially observed them, and that subsequently uh, he had taken George and Johnny into custody. Um, is there a element of suggestibility in the fact that this was not just a 
yes, I did it, and I'm telling you what happened versus the officers knowing what happened before the confession was given. I believe I followed your question. Um, what I can say is that um, this appeared to have been a horrific scene where these bodies were found. Um, I can tell that it not only impacted Johnny, but it also impacted Reverend Francis Batson. Um, and when I say Johnny, I mean Johnny George's brother as opposed to Johnny Hunter, the cellmate. Um, I would have expected there to have been a lot of questions. And I don't know that unless you were talking at a very fast pace that you would be able to have all of your questions asked and answered and leave no stone unturned with the brevity in which this interview was conducted. Having covered all of these areas, the underlying basis for your opinion, and I think we've covered them all now, have we not? I'm sorry, but we haven't. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I only have I, I only have part of this slide show, so please continue. <laughs> okay. <laughs> to the next slide. This one is short. <laughs> so when I look at the context of what factors George Stinney may have brought into um, the interaction, I determined in my analysis and methodology that he was likely suggestible and possibly highly suggestible. I had a hard time moving likely into highly because of the fact that there is no recording and I feel that that's a void of information that is not present that is very helpful for narrowing that down. But I found him to be highly compliant. With those, and so based on that, do you have a conclusion um, as to the reliability of this confession? Can we go over one more point pertaining to the psychological makeup sure. of the confessor? <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> the age and family culture are the things that I turn to when I'm looking at how the confessor, what psychological components they have that contribute to whether or not this is more or less likely to move into a false confession or if it's available to be a reliable <laughs> confession. And by age alone, I want to reiterate that this is an adolescent, a young adolescent brain that has not had opportunity to have 10 more years of development um, to, to refine himself with his psychological background and constitution. He doesn't have the ability to have higher order executive thinking and processes to be able to organize himself as meticulously or as rapidly as an adult would, um, that needs to be considered when you are putting him in the context of two adults interviewing one adolescent. And again, I want to reiterate that the family culture um, and how it applied to George personally was something that gives consideration to where his personal psychological makeup would contribute to impacting um, an assessment of whether or not the statement given would be more or less likely to be false. Are there different types of personalities or findings as to false confessions in the literature? There are. There are some um, things that I did not find evidence of that are in the literature that you would look to as well, and you can advance to the next slide, please. I was looking at educational deficits or having any evidence of George having had a low IQ, perhaps whether or not he would have had mental illness present at the time when he gave this confession, and I found no evidence to suggest that he was of a lower intelligence or lower educational um, background that would have been impacting this nor did I find any evidence or information that he had had a chronic debilitating mental illness that would have made him more vulnerable at the time. 
And again, I cannot talk about things of which I have no information, which relates to whether or not police misconduct or appropriate conduct would have had a role to play in the dynamics of this evaluation. So on the next slide, this is how I answered these questions. Does the confession fit the evidence? No. Is the confession internally consistent? No. Was, was the characterization of the interrogator suspect interaction and characterize it as coercive? And what is the psychological makeup of George, who was the confessor? He was vulnerable. And that is how I draw my conclusion. And your conclusion is? It is my prof professional opinion to a reasonable degree of medical certainty that the confession given by George Stinney, Jr. on or about March 24, 1944, is best characterized as a coerced, compliant, false confession. It is not reliable. Thank you. Can I ask you then that there has been an issue raised about why this is so long coming, why this issue, uh, the report, the family involvement uh, has been so delayed all of these years. Do you have an opinion that might suggest a reason for that based on your interviews of the two women? I would take the brother. question. I don't think this witness has any technical training to, to support a conclusion about why this case has been brought this year rather than 20 years ago. I don't think that's the question. I, I think the question that Mr. Chandler is trying to ask that, that I have a question of is at what point in forensic psychology do we start studying the reliability of confessions and specifically rel reliability of children's confessions? Obviously, this is a science that's been developing. Was it something that was considered or studied back in 1944? And where was its genesis and when did it start? I think she can't answer that question. At least I hope she can based on her training. <laughs> I found information that dated back to the 1860s that false confessions and psychological factors that need to come into evaluating whether or not this, there is a psych psychological basis that would influence the likelihood of generating a false confession, um, which tells me that by the time 1944 has arrived, it has had is that 84 years to be in existence, if my math is correct? And certainly, at that time, you may not have come up with the same conclusion as being a coerced, compliant false confession. Those words developed into the literature in, the in 1985 to so the mid-'80s. But whether or not, in 1944, what that opinion would have been would have been a false confession, or is it a reliable confession? That would have been the question. The qualifiers that I am able to give it today would not have been a nail, but right. But it was a science that was studied, and certainly we know that officers and law enforcement have been trained, and I don't know how long, but have been trained in how to uh, induce confessions and obviously get confessions in cases. Absolutely. Um, okay. And returning to my other question subject to the um, objection. Um, based upon your training as a, an adolescent child psychiatrist and as a general psychiatrist, in the um, circumstances that the delay of the sister's brother in reporting this or following through, do you have, is there a study, professional study or an underlying basis that you can give an opinion as to why this delay is likely or why it may have occurred. I understand what your objection is, Solicitor Finney. What he's calling for is a bit speculative. If there is a psychological basis of why you believe a family would not say anything, part of the concern in this case, and what's made it very difficult for me uh, in reviewing the case, is the passage of time, simply. And, and the question I think everyone is begging and wants to know is, why didn't they come forward, you know, in 1954 when we had Brown versus the Board of Education throughout the civil rights era? It's kind of a why now? What, why is it taking so long? I don't know if you have the basis or the background to be able to tell us 
I that can cancer? shed some light on it that may help um, an understanding develop. And solicitor, I will go ahead and I understand your objection. Certainly when I hear the answer, whether or not I think it's appropriate, I can consider it or not consider it. That's part of the, the beauty we have that, that she's testifying to me and not a jury. I can certainly know what is reliable and what I can accept um, and consider as to what is not. So I understand your objection. I am taking it into consideration. And again, based on her answer, I can accept or reject it. So thank you, sir. Them. Based on your interviews, et cetera, if you have an opinion, please address the court regarding that. Your Honor, the impact of having two brothers removed and um, not having had parents there to protect <coughs> any of the children at the time when that happened is something that the other children have carried with them for their life. Johnny, what I have learned, could not talk about this. It is possible that somebody who, if anyone had conducted an interview, could have investigated whether or not there was an anxiety component or problem that came about, almost as if PTSD could have been a model that would have fit, fit his reluctance and his inability to discuss this. So would Johnny have come <coughs> forth? He couldn't talk about it with his family. What is going to make him able to talk about it with anybody else outside the safety of his family is one of the concerns that I would have that would say Johnny was less likely to bring this forth. Um, the family moved in the middle of the night and their lives changed significantly. And their father took on the setting the stage for we are moving forward, we have nothing we can do to impact this, and we are going to carry on with our lives. There's Doctor, can I interrupt you with something? We, um, these were, when you were interviewing these adults, they were adolescents or children at the time. At the time when this happened, I believe Amy would have been six and Catherine would have been around nine. Okay. Uh, is there a, um, uh, stages of development um, scale that science has recognized in, that would, could be applied uh, there is. with certainty to this circumstance? There is, and that's what I'm getting at is that the family culture is going to influence the stages. So if you go to the last slide, I've actually outlined Eric Erickson's, um, keep going, I'm sorry, the next one. Thank you. Eric Erickson has studied the psychological development and applied it across the lifespan. That is what is unique, is that other models fit adolescence, or they fit childhood, or they fit the first five years of life, and then things change. Eric Erickson has applied how across all of our years, from birth until death, we all go through a development of change as it relates to the development of your psychological being in the context of your social circumstances. The events as they happened from the Stinney family's perspective with their brother George is certainly a social influence over their psychological development. The cultural tone that was set by George Stinney Sr was we are not looking back, we have nothing that we can do, and we are all moving forward. And that is how the family has fallen through and advanced from one stage of development to the next. Of all of those stages that are listed, and I've outlined them from infancy into adulthood, so you have to complete trust versus mistrust before you can move into autonomy versus shame and doubt. Once you have resolution of stage two, then you can move into trying to resolve stage three. All of those except for the last one pertain to how you navigate, perceive, and understand your psychosocial development in the present moment. How do you um, figure out when you're 16 years old whether you want to be emo or goth or you want to be somebody who looks different from that group? 
that, that has to be resolved before you move into intimacy and figuring out what are your roles in closeness of relationships. Um, or when you move into generativity versus stagnation and how do you parent what you have around you that your um, work ethic, your children, what's left that is there for you to give information to and share. It's in the present moment. It is not until this last phase of life that you enter into ego integrity and you try to look back in a retrospective manner and you try to assign a sense of fulfillment. And it's looking for that sense of fulfillment that if you end up feeling, feeling fulfilled, that would have been a healthy resolution for the ego integrity versus despair. Can you maintain your ego or do you live in the despair? And so this is the first stage that becomes retrospective. Everything else is present. So from a psychological perspective, this is the time, according to Erickson's model, when you have advanced in age, usually hit retirement, or 65 is about the age that reference is American textbooks. You can move up from 65. <laughs> And that's true. That's true. So someone who continues their path of their career or they are raising more children, a grandparent raising grandchildren, may stay in generativity versus stagnation because the circumstances of their life haven't moved them into that point of entering the ego integrity versus despair. And again, just like most everything else that we have in psychiatry, all of this is going to fall along a continuum. The movement from one to the next of these um, developmental stages, it's not going to be black and white, and it's going to fall along a continuum, and it's going to be something that is most likely going to be outside the realm of consciousness. In this case, uh, then addressing specifically the Stenny family, mm -hmm. um, were you advised as a result of your interviews that there was uh, other impediments um, to them uh, coming forward, financial, cultural, other things? Absolutely. Um, both Catherine and Amy identified that um, there were financial hurdles. There was a maintained concern that they had learned a sense of helplessness and that if they couldn't spare... Um, getting George an opportunity to retain an attorney at the time he was going up on a charge of murder, there was a learned helplessness that we talk about in psychiatry as well that told them for their uniqueness of circumstances and the events that they had happen in their life, no one was going to hear them, no one was going to listen. It was not going to be something that anybody would be willing to look at. Did they attempt then to go elsewhere outside of the ju judicial system to be heard? I can't tell you where they went to be heard specifically, but I know that the family has made contacts with various media avenues. There have been times where people have approached them um, looking for opportunity to gather information, and hurdles have been brought before them each time they have either indulged somebody's inquiry or they have gone and tried to bring attention to this particular case itself. In your interview with um, uh, Mr. Hunter, did he give you any indication that he had attempted to come forward any sooner than two or three months ago? He did. In fact, he referenced at least two previous times that he had attempted to um, take his knowledge and share it with someone, and he went through the media as well. Twice he called two major um, news networks, and twice he did not get a return phone call. And it wasn't until this third attempt that somebody called him back and brought his name forward. Did you find his, um, your conversation with him, your interview, and his affidavit um, added any greater weight to your opinion than other things? I find that the information that he presented added a balancing act. He has not known 
or had contact with the Stinney family prior to meeting George in the Sumter County Jail. He um, has not maintained contact with the family. The family doesn't know who he is if you say the name um, Johnny Hunter until yesterday when I said, well, let me tell you who he is. Neither sister had a knowledge of who Johnny Hunter would have been. Thank you so much. Mr. Finney? Thank you, Honor. Good morning, Dr. Salas. Good morning. I don't think I'm going to be very long. I certainly don't feel like I'm as smart as you are on this subject. I don't have a presentation that goes with your questions either. <laughs> that may be benefit us both. In the field of law, we generally talk about issues in terms of proof and the weight of proof, a preponderance, beyond a reasonable doubt. And if you take the scale of justice mm -hmm. as a symbol, we tend to try to talk to people, witnesses, judges, about tipping the scale and putting things on one side to make our point for our client. As a doctor, you talked about a continuum, but you've come to an opinion. And that opinion, I believe, is based on evidence, facts, study, that tends to tip your scale so that you believe at the end of your testimony that the confession of George Stanley was coerced and unreliable. Only to a degree of reasonable medical certainty. All right. Would it not be true that the scale that you use to come to that opinion would be affected by the fact that you did not talk to any of the family members of the, of the deceased girls? Would that scale be affected by the fact that I didn't have information from the victims, family, family members? Yes. <clears throat> if they had served as a witness and could say, I saw X, Y, and Z, if they All had right. added some factual information, right. then that would be helpful. All right. And so, and I apologize, I should have started out by saying, as a part of your investigation of this case, did you talk to any members of the family of the two girls? No, nobody identified right. themselves as a member and I was not. Right. And, and is it my understanding that you began the real digging work this week on this case? In terms of being contacted about this case, I was contacted about it this past Saturday. All right. And today is Wednesday. So it's been five days, six days? Five days. Yes, sir. That five you've been days. actively working on the case. Yes, sir. All right. And so prior to last Saturday, you've not talked to any of the victims' families members. No, sir. All right. Did you have a chance, either under your dissertation stage, which I assume was five or six years ago? 2010. Let's say three years ago. Either at that stage in your career or now as the last five days as a working mm -hmm. clinician, you have not read any newspaper articles from 1944 about the case? I didn't have any newspaper articles pertaining to the information that I have used in order to formulate my opinion. All right. And so you're not aware that over the last 70 years, newspapers in the area, even newspapers as far away as New York, have covered the Stinney case and given different accounts from people who know, knew the family of the girls and knew, the, knew George Stinney and his family. I don't know what is available in the media pertaining right. to this. I know that there's a book that is written. I understand that there is a movie. But as far as the breadth or depth of how far print material goes, I don't have knowledge about that. All right. So in the last five days, you found out from George's sisters and his brother, Charles, and the interviews that they that you did and the materials they submitted 
about George and his makeup as a 14-year-old. Correct. I have learned from the interviews and the sources of information and also from um, Johnny, who was his cellmate, Johnny Hunter. Johnny Hunter, who spent how many days with him? I don't know the extent of time that he was over at the Sumter County Jail specifically, but it was following conclusion of the trial, and it was approximately a day or two before he was leaving to be executed. All right. Do you know what Johnny Hunter's age was when he met George Stenny? He told me he was 17. Um, so in the last five days, you have not been able to determine, I should ask you, have you been able to determine um, anything about the police investigation of the case from the standpoint of uh, anything outside of what the family members of George told you. For example, you, you've been given the handwritten notes of Mr. Newman. Correct. Mr. Newman was a special investigator sent by the governor. I don't know if you knew that. He did not I work did, in Clarendon County. I did not have that knowledge. And I'm sorry. That's, that's incorrect. Mr. Newman was a deputy sheriff assigned to duties in Clarendon County. He was the one that wrote the report. Mr. Newman wrote the report. Okay. I don't know his official title. And I thought I heard you say that when George was interviewed, it was two against one. That was my understanding. Where did you get that from, that understanding? Excuse me, and he asked one question at a time. And I'd I'm be glad to. I'm sorry. I apologize. Going back to your testimony, you, you relied on the fact that George was in the room with two officers giving his quote-unquote confession. I can't remember if that was something that was in a discussion that I had, but in terms of factual, did I have re reference from another detective? There was no other detective statement that would be able to uphold that reference of being two. All right. So as far as you know, mm -hmm. based on the information that was submitted, George gave a statement confessing to the crime to a, an officer of the law. He certainly had at least one officer of the law that was there. And, and as far as you know, that's the only one that was there. As far as I have documentation, yes, right. sir. So you don't have anything to support the fact that there were two officers interviewing George at the time he gave his alleged confession? I can't think of a document that would support that at this point, no, sir. I also heard you say... that the brevity of the interview in Johnny's statements to the police officers caused you to be concerned. Mm -hmm. And then you, in, in your yes, testimony... Yes, the record. Yes. Apologize, Your Honor. And your testimony was that it was about an hour in length. Yes. Where did you get that information from? I believe that was something that was shared with me verbally from consultation with the defense. I the lawyers recall. told you that? Correct. All right. You didn't see any place in the written materials that you reviewed that Johnny had an interview with the police officers that lasted an hour. Let me look for just a moment, if you don't mind, because yes, the one question that I want to clarify is whether or not that was part of the stipulation of facts. Thank you, sir.
That is not part of the stipulation of facts. The times that were referenced, we're referencing numbers 12 and 13. So I don't know that that would have been something that there is a document to support, and I would be willing to acknowledge that that would be able to be removed from the analysis, but it would not change my opinion. Okay. And I guess I'll go back to my earlier theory that <coughs> if you did not, let me ask you this question, I apologize. Did you have any school records of George Stanley to review? I don't have documentation of school records, no sir. Did you have any health records, medical records or mental health records to review? No sir. And, and would you consider those to be important sources of information for making a finding about the competency of a child? They are very helpful and they are certainly things that when we are able to access a broader source of information, we certainly pursue getting both educational records as well as the medical and mental health records. I made a note on the outline that you were using and I marked it as number 15. It says on that slide, there is no evidence found to support educational deficits. But the truth is there were no records reviewed. Is that true? In terms of records, there was, let me get to that side please. In terms of records versus evidence, I don't have written records from a school that produced a grade performance or something, but I did make inquiry with the interviews with both sisters, as well as, like I was discussing, the understanding of the word execute. And from that piece of information, the limited can be applied to determine, should I have a concern about whether or not this is a cognitive de cognitively delayed individual or not. I've also learned that George was the secretary for his mother and he would scribe and do all of her writings, which gives me an idea that yes, when you put that into play, um, he had an ability to negate whether or not a deficit in education would have been a factor. So when I look at whether or not education or IQ or mental illness is present, I did, for what was available to me, an investigation to see if there was something that should say we need to be concerned about his education. The results of my inquiry and what I was looking for says that education did not come into play. Having a normal stage of education does not protect against moving you back down into a lower level of suggestibility. So because you have um, an age factor that can move you up the scale, just because you have normal education or normal IQ does not move you back down the scale. It just does not move you higher up the scale. And so basically you're saying that you did not review any school records, no health records, and that you relied on the interviews with the family's sisters who were six and nine at the time to make your assessment of George. As well as information from Johnny. Johnny Hunter. Johnny Hunter, who correct. Who don't know how many days he spent with George in the Sumter Detention Center. I can tell you that George was um, literate. I don't know how many days that he was there, but he was literate and he was able to read and I'll reference whether or not the wording is a reflection. And if that's a slide in your presentation? It's not a slide, okay. no sir. What this does, um, it moves George up the scale of what you would expect from being a concrete thinker into an abstract thinker. Abstract thinking is actually something that um, is a higher order of thinking. In the general population, it's estimated about 30% of people achieve abstract level of thinking. 
This is an adolescent moving into an abstract level of thinking that's higher order. Johnny had a magazine, and in the back of the magazine was an article, and he was paused on that page, and the page said, prepare yourself for the future. And he said, while he was on that page, and Johnny had no meaning of, like, there was no note as to why this would have been significant until he heard George's voice over his shoulder, and he said, gee, I don't have a future. What that indicates to me, from a psychological standpoint, and understanding where George's brain might have been at that time, is that he can not only read, but he is reading words that are larger than one or two syllables. Future yourself. Maybe they're two syllables. <laughs> um, and he is able to apply it to himself, and he's able to look in terms of a future orientation. And at 14, when you should be at a stage where you're invincible, he had developed a sense of brevity and understanding the imminence of his death. Um, how much of a factor would you have contributed to the information you received from investigator Newman that George took the investigator to the crime scene and recovered an iron pipe which was used to kill the girls. How much would weight would that carry? Yes, as far as a evaluation of George. It leads me down more questions and the results of those questions would be the influence as to how much weight it carries. So for example, if um, I find that somebody sharing information with me and pursuit of that information does not come to fit the evidence, that puts us back in the first question in the slides, of does this fit the evidence that's available? If it fits, it adds weight to being a reliable statement. If it doesn't fit, it moves you into false confession. Closer along that continuum in, in the less reliable. So that information is helpful for generating more questions to look at that continuum and assess it. If you have information that can move me along that, I would be more than happy to review it. Well, doesn't the fact that a 14-year-old is reported to have been able to take the lead investigator to a point and dig around in some bushes and show, retrieve an iron rod which he said he used, isn't that supportable information that would give it the continuum of trustworthiness? Not in and of itself. Okay. For example, if I take you to a place at 14 where I graze my cow every day or I go to church and play with my peers and I happen to have other information that brought me to leading you to something that would be reasonable to be by a railroad track, then maybe or maybe not it's going to depend on the context of those other circumstances and that's the crux of why this is so challenging is because our information, as you are able to even point out in what I have tried to accomplish very objectively, it's still something that we are missing components that had this been done in 1944 and people had followed these kinds of questions and brought information to light. If we had information from someone's pursuit of those questions and it was recorded, we could draw conclusions that might shift one direction or another and it might take where we are and move it up or move it down but with the information that we have we come to the conclusions as I presented them today. All right. At least I do for a professional opinion. May I ask, ask for a moment?
Dr. Salas, I thank you for your answers and your time. Thank you. If you please, Court. Doctor, you went over for us when you began some time ago the things that you considered in rendering your opinion. Um, am I correct then that you uh, read the um, evidence that was stipulated to? Yes. And the things that were presented to you by agreement of counsel? That's correct. Okay. As well as interviews of different individuals? Correct. That's correct. Did you find anywhere in the stipulation of the uh, evidence or any affidavit from the people sitting in the back? Mr. Chairman, I think we need to be careful because they have changed the stipulation. That's correct. And so you need a final copy of what was the stipulation. Then, then let me, let me there were some inconsistencies. Let me address these newspaper articles. If we were to tell you, um, I want you to read the newspaper articles of what happened over the last 70 years, what would your reaction as a professional psychiatrist, forensic psychiatrist, be as to the weight they should be given? They carry zero weight, and I don't want them as references. So the reason you have not considered those has to do with your professional opinion that they carry no weight. Newspaper articles and information that comes from a media source carry zero weight in determining a professional opinion. Now let's talk about the question that Solicitor Finney raised uh, con concerning his um, uh, uh, his memory that George Stinney Jr. took this uh, chief investigator to the scene and showed him the murder weapon. Is that correct? That's what he asked you about, right? He asked me about that. That's correct. Okay. Now, in the stipulations, it appears that the 15-inch iron rod has changed at least two other times and was referred to as a spike. I have seen it referred to as a spike, a 15-inch rod, and I believe it was described as an iron pipe. And so when you evaluate whether or not George Stinney Jr. actually did that, confessed to that, what, does those, what are those stipulations, if any, what concern does it cause you? It raises a concern pertaining to the question of internal consistency. If you have something that a confession sheds light on and you identify a weapon, from that point forward, if that is an accurate, reliable statement, you would expect consistency from that point forward to sustain itself over time. You don't expect the physical evidence of being an iron pipe or a spike to change while it sits in an evidence room or even out under the shrubs or in the brush. You would expect something of that nature aside from perhaps rusting, to still maintain its physical form and be consistent. Well, let me, let me take you to the end of this procedure. The uh, Olin Johnson letter that you were provided, that Correct. you read, credited the chief investigating officer with telling the governor personally um, that these girls, that this girl was raped, was killed, and raped her dead body was raped, and this man returned to rape her again, but the body was too cold. Do you recall reviewing that? I did review that. I was just she listening was to make certain it's consistent with what is written, and as you just articulated it, I believe you captured it quite accurately. Okay. And so the chief investigating officer told, made an official statement to the governor that this woman had been raped once after she was killed. Does the medical report or the report of Dr. Stevens confirm that that was a true statement? I'm going to have to object because, as Mr. Chandler well knows, the officer who reported to the governor in that letter was Mr. Pratt. Mr. Pratt is not the officer who wrote the investigating no, no. report and was a deputy for the Clarendon County Sheriff's Department by the name of Newt. And my questions have been conformed to Mr. Newman's uh, information that was supplied to the witness. If the court, please. 
Your objection is sustained. I think you just need to rephrase the question. Um, what I have is, quite frankly, um, I have just talked with the officer who made the arrest in this case. And my understanding, that's the Johnson letter, and my understanding, the officer who made the arrest in this case was Mr. Newman. I did not intentionally mischaracterize that. Okay. Well, you just need to ask this witness a question. The so question, let's go the, forward. The question is, do you find in your research validity in the statement that was made to Governor Johnson? I did not find that what Governor Johnson reflected in terms of having a sexual motivation to be supported by the physical evidence as described in the medical examiner's report by Dr. Bazard, nor did I find it to fit the sexual stage of interest that George would have been at based on the interviews that I have conducted. Do you know the date of the development of that Eric Erickson study? I don't know the specific date. I believe it came out in the early 1900s. I can't tell you specifically what that, when that came into our literature base. How long did you work on the George Stenney case uh, in, your in your dissertation? Ooh, it was several months. I can't quantify time. It felt like I was working all the time, but I know all of that work was not related to that particular case, but it was a rigorous program that I went to. Do you consider yourself to have sufficient background in the case, notwithstanding the hours you spent now, uh, to render the opinion you had given today? With the background, is it applies to what I am here to be able to provide expert testimony on today. I'm doing my very best to have my testimony and my opinion reflect the facts of the case as known to me from post-call from you. The reason why I am here is because of my previous experience in looking into these matters from 2010. And so, although I cannot recall exactly what I studied and cannot cite for you all of the re references and resources that I use to gather the information, I feel that my knowledge is an understanding of the issue as it pertains to evaluating whether or not a statement is reliable or not, whether or not a confession that has been given is more or less likely to be false. I feel that despite the limited information, I have done a sufficient job with the time that I have had to do this and the effort that has gone into trying to contact the family members to be able to make an opinion. Otherwise, I would not make an opinion. Thank you. Please, the court. Doctor, I have one final issue. I think we've already covered it, but you brought it back up on recross. It deals with the murder weapon, and you marked it as being fluid over time. Yes. Isn't it a fact, doctor, that you would be concerned about the murder weapon being called different things if George Stinney was doing the changing? But in your references, the words iron pipe, 15-inch iron rod, spike, were being changed by the solicitor, the investigating officer, other people in the court system, not by George Stinney. It is true that it was reflected in their statements which are what we have to look towards understanding the context of what might have gone on in the dialogue that like I've what my what I've tried to reiterate is that we do not have the documentation of the actual words that were exchanged in that interrogation so I do not have the ability to look at a transcript or a video or another primary source of what that confession entailed. I don't have a written statement that says, I, George Stinney, confess to blah, blah, blah. And so we look around the perimeter, and yes, 
the people who were very close in investigating this matter are the people that I do look towards their statements in understanding what George Stinney would have communicated in a confession. But the fact of the matter is that the words that ch were changed that you call fluid were words by other people, not George Stinney. That is correct. Thank you, ma'am. Anything further? No, ma'am. Dr. Salas, you may step down. May I be excused? Any objection to Dr. No Salas being excused from the state or the defense? We agree. You may be excused, doctor. Thank, Thank you. you. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go ahead and take a very brief recess. Uh, by the clock up in the courtroom, it is about 13 after. If we could all come back in about 10 minutes, if we would, let's proceed through to lunch, uh, get as much testimony up as we can, and uh, we'll be back. We'll be at ease for 10 minutes. Thank you. Yes.